all American military forces, all American military bases, all NATO bases around the world, all their conventional weapons are obsolete. They cannot even defeat the Houthis, you know, a bunch of people in the mountains. That's where, you know, it's ridiculous. As John said, this is a farcical uh, situation. That the reality is that the economic reality of the West has been under, you know, deteriorating and is unable to wage anything meaningful. All right. Well, here we are again. It's a uh, it's it's a different time slot, but um, and different faces and same faces. But welcome again to the show. Um, it's a show about the present state of the world and hopefully a show that will help us all and our viewers and people around the world think about what the future state of the world could possibly look like. I realized that last time we did the show, I didn't even introduce myself and that's probably a little bit remiss of me. Um, I think everyone else is far more important than me, but um, for the sake of um, completeness, my name is Warwick Powell. I'm an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology. I'm a senior fellow at Taiha Institute, and um, and I've got the pleasure tonight of um, being your host and sitting back and listening to the ideas and the analysis and the thinking of everyone else who's on the panel today. So we've got, again, in no particular order, um, Pascal Lottes, who uh, operates the Neutrality Studies channel. Um, which is going great guns on YouTube. Um, in fact, I don't know how Pascal does it in between everything else he does. Um, and Pascal is actually the technical host of our um, panel today as well. So thanks again, Pascal, for the work that you do. Um, we have Digby Wren. Digby is a, a, a senior advisor to the Cambodian government and is a, um, a significant um, international relations scholar and an educator working out of the uh, Royal Academy in, um, in Phnom Penh. We have joining us for the first time an old friend and an old friend of um, multipolarity, um, Hussein Askari from the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. Welcome, Hussein. It's great to see you. And I'm Thank you very much. In your brains. Very um, happy earlier, to be with this uh, great group. Fantastic. We've got um, David uh, Wallaloo. Uh, who is well known um, across the independent media landscape as one of the most active and prominent educators and content creators um, who joins us from Dallas, Texas. S.L. Kanthan, who comes to us from Bangalore in India and brings a, a very unique and an important perspective when we're talking about the unfolding world of multipolarity. Welcome again, S.L. S.L. is the host of Geopolitics Decoded, I think, if I've got that right. Um, if I haven't, forgive me, um, but um, no doubt Pascal will have everybody's details in the description below. Ina Tangan um, is a global commentator on global affairs and uh, is based in Beijing these days, but um, takes a broad sweep in terms of uh, keeping an, an, a close eye on what's happening around the world, particularly in terms of how it affects peace and development. I'm really happy to finally be able to meet face to face with um, with Kathleen, who's in London. Kathleen's an author um, and a former central banker. I don't know if that is a tick or a cross, um, but I guess that depends on your perspective and your particular moment in life. But um, uh, the book that it's Kathleen's a long, author... long time ago. <laughs> um, but I was certainly in London in the 1990s. <laughs> well, it certainly uh, brings a depth of experience and knowledge. Oh. I'm better known as a plumber of capital markets infrastructure. Um, I was a co-inventor of something and... called Triparty Repo, which is now 18 trillion a day in interbank secured credit. So was that a good um, idea? Coming. It was absolutely. Um, it was. A, it was a, 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 a globalization of the economy wouldn't have been possible without it. Um, so it was absolutely a good idea. And I got U.S. So, Treasuries into Luxembourg, into the Green Depository. Um, both of those things, you know, globalized globalized credit, globalized banking, globalized markets. And, uh, you know, as long as we don't screw it up, it's a good system. 
Correct. And um, out of all of that experience is a book that is called Multi-Currency Mercantilism, um, which yeah. is available from all good bookstores. And I'm a drawer. Available on Amazon. Available on Amazon and, and other good bookstores. John Pang, um, a scholar and a former government advisor from, uh, from Malaysia, um, working in China at the moment, but... Um, uh, crosses backwards and forwards to build bridges within Southeast Asia. And um, we have last but not least, um, Anna Malandogui. Um, and uh, forgive me if my pronunciation is <clears throat> at a very, very low level, but I will promise to work hard to improve that as time goes by. Anna is a, uh, is a renowned a researcher and scholar on uh, on Southeast Asian matters and particularly in relation to developments impacting the Philippines and also the relationships between Philippines and China. So thank you everybody for coming today. Um, where we're at is um, at the end of a week where NATO has held its 75th anniversary summit in New York. And from my perspective, it was quite a macabre, sombre affair, particularly in terms of the the decor and the fit out and the colour schemes and the shading. But, you know, other than those aesthetic elements, it certainly has um, made some very bold statements about its own views of itself, um, its purpose in the world and how it sees the world unfolding and what it needs to do. And uh, perhaps we can kick off today's panel with a little bit of an overview as to what has come out of this NATO summit. And I might pass it to Pascal to do that because Pascal's actually done a video um, yesterday around these themes. So perhaps, Pascal, you can just bring us all up to speed with what's happened out of NATO. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Warwick, again, for uh, convening the panel. So the the NATO summit just closed, and the most important thing actually was published uh, the day before the, the, the closing meeting, which is the outcome document, uh, the communique, or this time they actually called it a declaration. I don't know where, where whether there's 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 a difference in, in that, but it's structured like all the out, other outcome documents, uh, like last year from Vilnius, it starts with the we, the heads of states of the 32 member countries. I mean, this year is the first time that they have 32 because now uh, Sweden has uh, also joined. And the, the document obviously is not something that was negotiated at the event, but that was done previously. And I suppose that you just had to make sure that all the 32 actually signed off on it. I don't know how you did that. That's a real question because right before... This event, we had uh, Viktor Orban, who's, of course, the head of state of um, of uh, Hungary, who traveled to Moscow and Beijing and now just uh, yesterday or like 12 hours ago met with Mr. Trump. And obviously, obviously, he's not on board with the general NATO message, but the general NATO message is uh, we stand united. Nobody can divide us. Uh, the Russia is the sole uh, is the biggest threat to European security and is the is the only one to blame. It actually says that again in the document for the uh, for the war in Ukraine. And most importantly, the document for the first time mentions that China uh, ha has responsibility as well for the war. I mean, if it wasn't for China, then uh, Russia could never have uh, could never sustain its warfare it's a it's an up it's an utterly ridiculous narrative but that's what's in there and the Jens Stoltenberg as actually um uh, in his in his message also said several times that Russia is uh, China is to blame for a lot of the things that Russia are able to do they are blaming dual use goods um for enabling uh, Russia to to still uh, um uh, do war on uh, on Ukraine and dual use goods is just a very old idea, actually, of expanding the definition of contraband of war. So on the one hand, NATO re uh, uh, actually acknowledges that, Ru that China doesn't send weapons directly to uh, Russia, but it accuses China of, uh, of, of sending dual use goods. So this is another way of putting pressure. NATO puts pressure on China to 
uh, stop trading with Russia. That's the main that's the main baseline saying. And it also says, like, if you don't stop this, then the um, the we will expand sanctions and there will be more sanctions. And you, China, have to expect sanctions from the European Union, which is like an indirect command to the Europeans to now take over uh, a lot of U.S. sanctions on uh, on China and just, you know, expand this uh, economic warfare on China as well. And it seems that we are moving in that direction. Uh, one more significant thing is that NATO decided to to um, give $40 billion next year to Ukraine, which is what they estimate what they what is needed by in order to to maintain the current level of carnage. Uh, in order to keep on fighting until the last Ukrainian, $40 billion uh, distributed according to uh, this pro uh, proportionally according to GDP. Um, this, what we know from the media, is meant to Trump proof uh, Ukraine aid by basically outsourcing it to NATO. But this is, of course, a dumb narrative because. Uh, if everybody from NATO has to put has to put up money proportionally, then uh, fifty five percent of those forty uh, billion will should come from the United States next year. And the, the the outcome document is also quite vague in the sense that it says you know anything counts towards these forty billions: direct payments, uh, humanitarian aid, military aid, uh, in kind aid. So you can already see how the how the the outcome document tries to keep the definition of aid as vague as possible. Um, so I think that's where we are. The main the main issue today being that NATO seems to want to shift blame to China. Interestingly, though, I, they although they had four basically Pacific nations joining uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and uh, South Korea, they didn't invent anything new there. I, I at least I haven't seen any new way of docking in these four Pacific Island nations. I mean, they are now they are they are there they're observing what's happening but i haven't heard any announcement of nato operationally doing something new toward a a asia pacific that we haven't known already beforehand yeah great thanks pascal um kathleen you're in london and we've got a new government in london that made great haste to get itself on the phone to washington and to demonstrate it's um i guess it's it's um loyalties to uh, the uh, the the washington and nato arrangements um we also know that nato has over the course of the last month or two at the very least been talking up this china threat and china responsibility issue as an rationale to justify its move into asia but it doesn't just want to move into asia it wants to become a global organization doesn't it yes um absolutely uh two two outcomes um that were uh, omitted from pascal's summary our new nato office to be established in jordan in the middle east and uh the nato declaration that sounds ominous um, also includes uh, targeting Africa, expansion of NATO cooperation into Africa. So they really um, used this this 75th anniversary to make it official that they are no longer North Atlantic. They are now Pacific, Middle East, Africa, um, a global force for war. Well, the A perhaps now stands for uh, Africa, and, Asia, and America as well, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and in terms of Keir Starmer, I think what's happened is they wanted the, the prime minister for World War III. And uh, Keir Starmer has uh, a long track record of cooperating with Washington. Um, he was selected as our next prime minister by Mike Pompeo, very likely. Um, so that'll provide continuity into Trump. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's never disobeyed a direct order from Washington. So uh, he'll continue that in his premiership. Unfortunately, um, he's he, the the announcements that he made uh, as prime minister basically within the first day were more money to Ukraine, eighty seven billion in UK military expenditure, 
and um, uh, um, seeking um, hypersonic missiles. So, you know, he's definitely the wartime prime minister. We just don't have the World War III quite yet. Looks like that they're working on it, though. Um, look, Anna, um, in terms of the perspectives from Asia, um, what's your sense in terms of the reactions to this globalisation move by NATO and its very clear statement of, of intent, I think, that... Um, it seeks to intensify um, its its, uh, its its activities and focus within the Asian arena. Um, I think from the from from what I can see from the Asian context, especially in Southeast Asia, um, of course, a lot of people, I mean, are very much worried that NATO will will have presence in in the Asia Pacific region, and it will open an office, or I think it's already. I, I'm not really sure, but an office in Japan, and 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 I think the Philippines also is in 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 the middle of all of these things. Given that there's a big and a strong influence coming, um, with the current administration of Marcos Jr., I mean, as you can see, um, the presence of American forces. Now we have an RAA, which actually uh, already signed between the two governments, Japan and the Philippines. It would mean also that. Amer um, Japanese troops and Japanese military assets could be transferred in the Philippines, and you have already, um, a, you know, a missile launcher in the north of the Philippines. So all of these things are quite very critical, and it seems that like the way we see it, um, people who who are against these things and peace peacemakers in, in, in Southeast Asia and even in the Philippines are very much worried that all of these things that's going in the country in the Philippines right now, the militarization of the Philippines, the very active presence of American forces, military assets, Japan is coming in, you have Australia also in my country. I think it's all connected to the, the plan that NATO in, in any ways is really trying to have a presence in, in Asia Pacific and you have this kind of trilateral pack and also um, with Japan, United States and, and the Philippines in a way, militarily speaking. So all of this in a matter of time, we personally and other people with the same kind of advocacy, we see it as a preparation for any kind of, hopefully not, no, but war in, in, in the horizon. I think that that's that's how we feel, but of course, as much as possible, we want to prevent this. And also, we have our own challenges in in our own country. Given that the current administration of the Philippines and Marcus Jr., as you can see, is really heavily influenced by the United States, and it's he's like a puppet, like you know, Zelensky in that sense. So, with with regard to NATO, we know that you know it wants to extend itself in in Asia Pacific, and you you can see already some rem um presence of 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 their forces because the American forces are very strong in my country at the moment. So yeah, it's a bit alarming, and of course it's not good, but the situation is a little bit more critical, I think, as far as the Philippines is concerned, because the Philippines is really among Southeast Asian countries is the one that has a military um, pact and treaty with the United States. And now it has a military defense pact with Japan. So, yeah. Yeah, it certainly puts the Philippines uh, very much in the, well, I was going to say in the firing line, though that's probably not a particularly good turn of phrase. Um, uh, Digby, sticking with this um, perspective from Southeast Asia, um, what are you hearing on the ground from uh, from Phnom Penh? Oh, well, I just had a meeting this afternoon with some people in one of the leading think tanks here. The, basically, there's two or three think tanks. Uh, I, I'm connected to all of them. Uh, and, the well, they're clearly not happy. They, they don't want to see any destabilization of the region. They, they don't want any interference. <laughs> Uh, and they see this as is causing complications. I mean, I think that the term they used uh, exactly was this is just further complications of an already difficult uh, situation. And uh, uh, and I think in reply they asked me quite a lot of questions actually about what I thought. And um, 
I could just share a little bit of that with you. Uh, the first one was, you know, the first thing to say is that there is no conflict in the Pacific. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the point of NATO coming here to sort of help peace and stabilization is kind of a contradiction already because, uh, as everybody's uh, in, said, it's it's just a further complication and it does destabilize more. Uh, and so it's doing the exact opposite of what it's going to claim to do. Um, I think the other thing that, that came about of that from that conversation was that Japan's role is greater than most people think. They're actively mm. doing this. Um, mm. they, Japan has been the power behind the quad arrangement in real terms. Um, yes. And they yes, and they uh, they the Japanese uh, feel that uh, that they need to uh, they they're the most fearful of all in in terms of losing any kind of control over over the Pacific, um, and and they see that slipping away. In fact, and that's mostly uh, due to their own insecurities, but also because of their economy. I mean, their economy has been stagnant for thirty years, and it's not getting any better, and their exports are dropping. Uh, well, at the same time that their that their currency is dropping, so there's an enormous amount of insecurity in Japan, uh, and so they're pushing for this as hard as they can. And the Americans, of course, are very happy to to push them along, help them try and do that. Uh, and then the other thing that came out of this was uh, something related to AUKUS, and that is, for example, that although the Australians are probably never going to get those submarines, it's highly unlikely. But what they did get, and what they have been getting, is capacity upgrading. And I think that the, the, that that there's a kernel of truth in this that that this expansion to of NATO into the Pacific is going to cover the uh, capacity upgrading, so interoperability of weapon systems, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, new uh, capabilities with cyber, with satellite, with all that sort of thing. Uh, and and the Americans, of course, are very keen to do this because it'll tie their tie all of these uh, the IP4, for example, tie them into very long term military contracts. Uh, which will ensure that the Americans have uh, some input for their uh, for their industrial base and for the services that are required after you've supplied weapons. Uh, and so that's very much a sort of an economic as well as a military thing. Uh, and then I, just, to, just so I don't speak too, too long about this, um, the other thing that came out of that conversation was the idea that, um, in fact, it really displays that... Uh, that all these economies, so the American economy, the Japanese economy, the German economy, the European economy, all in recession or functionally or technically in recession. And here they are trying to expand uh, their military uh, coverage of the globe, which costs enormous amounts of money. Uh, and so how are they going to pay for all of this? And so the obvious answer is that it's basically a QE4. They're actually going to print money and pump it into their economies for their industrial bases. Uh, while their economies are in recession. So it's a kind of a tool to revitalize their economies. So it casts some doubt uh, into the long term, uh, not the short term, but definitely the medium to long term uh, viability of this 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 project. Uh, and, and at this point in time, I think it really is only a project. And it's making a, you know, it's a it's a big splash for 75 years, but uh, I don't think it's going to have any legs, really. Look, I will want to come back to really these questions of viability, both in an economic sense as well as some of the other challenges that I think um, this this uh, the grand plan, the seventy fifth anniversary grand plan, uh, might confront. But perhaps before we do that, I just want to get some perspectives also from um, from John um, again um, from Southeast Asia, um, you know, a region that actually, as Digby said, does not have any conflict. Um, you know, being now targeted by an organisation to supposedly we'll bring we'll create peace. something, <laughs> we'll create some conflict to bring peace. Um, feedback, John, from um, from the folk that you're talking phrase was, to. Sorry to interrupt you, Warwick. The phrase was uh, uh, the United States is both the core is is the cause of the destabilisation and it's offering the cure. Yeah. So it's cause <laughs> and cure. Which is, this is a very, very familiar model. This is the <laughs> self-licking, the self-licking ice cream cone, right, uh, of, of U.S. policy. Um, there is, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's quite uh, interesting to be in this in this in this forum, which is, uh, you know, we have a global circle of friends, and Southeast Asia is usually actually not represented, uh, and here we're almost overrepresented. Um, 
But I think this this issue of NATO globalizing itself um, has been a useful one for us to focus on uh, over the course of of this week, right? As I said, uh, kind of a NATO week. Um, And there is actually, but this doesn't sort of take away from the sense that there is something both um, uh, uh, worrying and troubling, but at the same time farcical about global NATO. You just can't get away from it. You know, as Digby was saying just now, we have all these countries in domestic internal crisis, both economic and actually political. Um, they have just started the greatest land war in Europe since the Second World War. And then, then in the middle of it, it's escalating. Uh, and there is real, there's serious concern that, that this is uh, going to be go out of control and escalate into a second uh, into a third world war, which will involve the rest of us in it again. Remember that from the perspective of Asia, from the perspective of the rest of the world, it's Europe that is the progenitor of world war. As I learned from Pascal, this is about this is going to be about the fifth world European world war. These generalized conflicts of all against all. This is not something you find in you know a lot in 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 Asian history. So th- there's something about this, and they're dragging us into this. this you know, forces us to look at this in a broader perspective. Last last time we met, we spoke about the uh, five principles of coexistence. We had time to talk about that. I always look at things from an ASEAN perspective. Next year we celebrate uh, the 70th, 70th anniversary of the the Bandung Conference, at which these five principles these principles of coexistence, of neutrality, and so forth uh, were adopted on very, very widely across most of the world, actually. So you have one principle of world ordering, and you have NATO very neatly and in, in, with self-declaration, and that's the declaration is the exact word, um, pushing another way of organizing the world, the, which is completely abhorrent, actually, to the way things are done in, in Southeast Asia. I just want to say this. This is really not the way we do things. It's abhorrent. It is everything that you want to avoid. But think of it from the Southeast Asian perspective. Over the last 18 months or even 12 months, think of the number of these mini lateral or these these alliance structures laid on top of a structure that we already had for East Asian regional coordination, security uh, coordination, and and so on. It's it's not as if there weren't already these structures, which we like to say are centered on on ASEAN. Uh, so uh, not just for on the diplomatic level, for but for defense uh, establishments of of all the countries in East Asia, for the United States uh, as well, uh, to, to be involved and to have their say. But then you have this. You have AUKUS. You have the Quad. You have the trilateral, as Anna was saying. Right between Japan, Japan, Korea, South Korea, and and the U.S., and now you want NATO in here. I'm not sure how this is all going to fit together. The big picture is it seems as if, you know, the the farcical and the ludicrous in this is what the hell is the German Navy going to be doing out here or the Dutch Navy? <laughs> this is a maritime region, okay? So what you want the, the Dutch and the Spanish back here? What are they going to contribute? A lot of this is going to be about upping the contribution. Actually, it's about increasing the burden sharing from the U.S. perspective. I hear a lot of voices now, okay, from the U.S. about NATO members taking more of their own share. A lot of it's going to be that. You guys are going to have to stump up. There's, of course, going to be more sort of interoperability and so on and so forth, but there is truly a ludicrous aspect to this. I'm not sure they add anything to the danger that there already is. It just makes it more incoherent and just flat out crazy, you know, um, I'll yeah, I, I think, and I'll just observe that the French and the Dutch navies didn't last very long in the Red Sea against the Houthis. Yeah, that was just well, the Houthis, and, and, right? <laughs> so. Well, and 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 that point, Kathleen, I think is going to, in a sense, um, continue to bug this NATO plan because a plan is one thing, and stated ambitions is one thing, but I think we're starting to see that there are that well there's more to a plan than just being able to have a declaration i guess 
and there are significant issues in reality, both in a physical sense, but also the reality of financing and resourcing uh, these ambitions that may end up causing other problems. Speaking of um, burden sharing, um, Hussein, uh, Sweden's just come in. You're in Sweden these days. Uh, what's the sort of state of play in terms of the the expectations and the attitudes? Um, I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the political elite within the Swedish establishment are, of course, um, looking forward to being members of NATO, but there may be nonetheless residual concerns within the sort of broader society about what this actually entails for the country that has been in effect neutral for, you know, a long time. Yeah, well, I think uh, both watching the NATO summit, but also Sweden being there is uh, quite tragic. Uh, actually shows what a an existential crisis we are living in here. I'm not, I don't happen to be in Sweden. I'm a Swedish citizen. I have lived here for more than 30 years. I have children and grandchildren born and raised here in Sweden. And I'm worried about their future because with the militarization of our society, by the way, usually in Sweden, uh, as you said, we are a neutral country for more than 200 years. Uh, and for such important things, strategic things, uh, like joining NATO, you usually have a referendum. Uh, this time it was not allowed to have a referendum because they suspected that the people would vote no. And therefore there would be no referendum. We are in a war situation. We are in a war economy. We are in a war mobilization. We are under threat. We have security issues, no more discussions. So everybody from left to right have to follow a uniform policy. And any discussion to the contrary will be considered as aiding the Russian war uh, effort. So people here are terrified to speak, uh, you know, about the rationality of continuing the support for Ukraine. Now, we have had deep financial, economic, social problems in Sweden, not now, not the last 10 years, not since the Ukraine war, but since the 1990s. Because we have had a deindustrialization policy at least since the late 80s. People think that deindustrialization in Germany started in, with the Ukraine war. No, it started in the 1990s. I witnessed that myself. I was working in the Schiller Institute in Germany, and I saw how the green ideology was devouring the German society in the name of protecting the environment. So deindustrialization was a fact long time ago and was replaced by this consumer society come financialization of society, which we are a huge financial bubble. It's ready to burst anyway. And this is the underlying reality actually of the elites in Europe and the United States, hoping to have another splendid war as Winston Churchill said to solve, to solve their problems. Now, we have, we have to divert now 2% of our GDP to the war mobilization, throwing money into Ukraine, into the, what Pascal said, you know, it's like the, a carnage where young Ukrainian and now even older Ukrainian men, and some women are being sacrificed for a useless war effort. Uh, this whole thing is like we have to cut more in our healthcare, education, infrastructure, more than what we have had. You know, we're already in trouble, but we will have even more trouble. And this is making people frustrated all over Europe. That's why you see in the elections, all people, instead of speaking out, they vote. And then you have a chaotic situation where nobody can really form a government, but it's more and more people are expressing their frustration by voting to right-wing extreme parties who would seem, seem to be against the mainstream. So the thing is what, you know, all this talk about global NATO, NATO has been globalized for a long time. My native country, Iraq, was a victim of that system, although it was not in the name of NATO. Iraq, where I was born, it was destroyed by the rules-based order for uh, the right to protect and all this nonsense. But this whole, you know, a bunch of people in the mountains, th that's where, you know, it's ridiculous. As John said, this is a farcical uh, situation. That The reality is that the economic reality of the West 
has been under you know deteriorating and is unable to wage anything meaningful. Now, if people forget actually that in August 2021, uh, people woke up to find out that that uh, the emperor had no clothes when NATO had hurry up and leave Kabul and Afghanistan. That was the end of the global NATO. The utter, utter failure, 20 years in Afghanistan, and everything was back to box one. They didn't build one road in Afghanistan. and They didn't build any yeah. hospital in Afghanistan. So the only danger is from the insanity of the elites in Europe and the United States, where they say we have to defeat a nuclear power. It, you cannot defeat a nuclear power with conventional warfare. You, uh, you can only defeat a nuclear power using nuclear weapons. And this is what is scary. Everything else which is being talked about, you know, go, moving global, going to the South Pacific, all this is nonsense. You know, these rusty ships the British and the Australians have, and including the United States. I mean, American military experts say even the American aircraft carriers, they will be sunk in five minutes in a war with China. So just forget about this. The problem is that we are losing time and energy instead of building bridges and building the world economy, ridding the world of poverty and prospering together. And this is what is the tragic, you know, this one week before the NATO summit, I was in Beijing attending the celebration of the 70th anniversary of the five principles of peaceful coexistence. I actually was there listening to President Xi. I was at the luncheon with uh, Minister uh, Wang Yi I gave him, actually, I met him and gave him my book as a gift. And then you hear, you, I, I follow the, uh, the, the summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And the language and the sentiments you feel there about harmony, cooperation, prosperity, optimism, you know, is such a contrast to coming back here to Sweden and watching the EU summit, uh, the, the, sorry, the NATO summit. And the language there being used, like confrontation, we are the best, we should you know, defeat the others, the others are bad, we have to save ourselves. It's like complete contrast, two different philosophies clashing in the world now. And that's where I see the danger is. I don't see there is a danger of the NATO being able to win any conventional warfare. What they will do is they will create trouble and they will delay economic development among nations. And uh, exchange, you know, cultural, civilizational cooperation. And this is what is really sad. Look, this is actually the perfect segue really into what, in a sense, in my mind was part two, which is um, bringing it back to the contrast between NATO and its sort of modus operandi and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization by way of contrast. And you touched on that. And we'll come back to a bit more of that, I hope, shortly. But I really want to pick S.L. Canthan's brain and then David's brain on two other events that have happened um, against the backdrop of this NATO week. And that is, um, firstly, the visit to Russia by the Indian Prime Minister Modi as the uh, first place that he visited after the election, which I think is um, uh, quite unusual um, going to Russia uh, for this. And then um, after getting some insights from USL. I'd like to get David's insights. David's pretty close to Florida where he is, and that was the last stop for Viktor Orban um, on his five-city um, peace tour. And then I'm going to throw back to you, Ina, to, in a sense, maybe pull some of these threads together before we get back into, I guess, thinking more constructively about what an alternative might begin to look like. So, SL, what are your thoughts um, against this backdrop and with um, with Prime Minister Modi heading off to Moscow? Sure. Uh, so I think it was uh, really a watershed moment in uh, India's uh, foreign policy. Uh, because if you look at uh, the timing, the words and the actions, it was very shocking for the West. And you can see the pain and uh, the agony that everybody in the US is feeling. And uh, the Modi government, they did all of that very specifically and uh, purposefully. So uh, there was no need for him to go to Russia now as the first nation after his uh, third election. 
he could have just uh, waited for uh, the BRICS summit later this year, and he could have just met with Putin. But he really wanted to send a message saying, hey guys, uh, we are going to have a strategic autonomy and we have realized that it's a multipolar world and we are not going to be a vassal of the US. The world is changing and uh, here is the message. So uh, the timing, uh, that's number one. And then the words, you know, uh, well, if there is a one phrase uh, the US really, really hates, uh, and uh, that's multipolar world, okay? <laughs> because the phrase multipolar world uh, means at the end of uh, the unipolar world, means uh, the end of the American century, the end of Pax Americana. It's just very uh, gloom and doom, uh, the phrase multipolar world. <laughs> And uh, the Indian establishment has been like saying it nonstop over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, Jay Shankar, he said, uh, the multipolar world is totally unstoppable. <laughs> you know? So he basically uh, sent a, me a message to uh, the US, listen, uh, this is the future. And then he went on to say that if there is one uh, constant in uh, global geopolitics, that's uh, the India-Russia relationship. Wow, you know, that must have really, really hurt the Washington DC's uh, hearts and uh, the internal organs, you know, <laughs> because he basically now, said, listen- Now jump in quickly, SL here, jump in quickly because um, the, um, the American ambassador to India made some remarks about yes. India's standing. Yes. Um, and basically said, you can't be neutral. It's yes. not possible. It's not going to accept right. that. But of course, that's exactly what India is doing. Yeah. So uh, that comes afterwards, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, Jay Shankar's words were uh, before Modi's trip. So he said, there's only one constant in uh, the uh, geopolitics of the world, and that's India-Russia relationship. So he basically said, listen, uh, the U.S.-India relationship, eh, Sometimes it comes, uh, sometimes it goes. It's not dependable. So that must have really hurt Americans. So that's why, you, uh, you know, uh, you can see the pain on the social media, the New York Times, Washington Post, they're all crying. And then uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, to India, he gave a speech uh, yesterday and he kind of uh, reframed uh, George Bush's uh, famous uh, warning, you know, like if you are not with us, then you are against us. So he said, uh, listen, uh, there is no such thing as uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, because if there is a, uh, of a conflict, uh, uh, then you cannot have a, a strategic autonomy. You have to choose a side. So first of all, uh, that's a wrong logic. You know, people have stayed uh, neutral all the time uh, throughout the history of world, World War II, you know, uh, Switzerland, right in the middle of Europe. He said, hey, guys, I'm sorry, I'm not going with anyone. Right. So uh, that's a ridiculous argument or uh, logic. Um, I mean, and number two, you know, uh, the U.S. is at war all the time. Then uh, uh, that means India has. Uh, but no strategic autonomy because it has to take side with the warmonger all the time, you know. So, uh, but this is like a, a lady having a boyfriend who uh, but gets into bar fights every weekend, you know, and then he always blames others. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, those are uh, the timing and the words, and then uh, the actions, you know. He. Uh, uh, there was no need for so much uh, love shown in the photo ops between Modi and Putin, you know. They gave each other big hug. They called each other my friend. They went on uh, the golf court and uh, dinner, tea. Uh, it was just a total, uh, I mean, a love fest, which must have been so horrible for the Americans to watch. And then uh, they also signed a lot of deals. And uh, India, Russia are working on so many long-term deals, you know? 
uh, whether it's uh, the joint production of uh, various military weapons from uh, rifles uh, to uh, BrahMos missiles to uh, the Su-30 fighter jets. There's a lot of, uh, of technology transfer that Russia is uh, really willing to do. Uh, that's number one. And then uh, the trade, uh, the north-south, uh, the transport corridor uh, through Central Asia and Iran, uh, that must uh, really uh, take off uh, at the U.S. Uh, because India is uh, bonding with, uh, with two of America's rivals, Russia and Iran. <laughs> so that's really terrible. And then India is... Uh, uh, we're trying to do, you know, uh, so Putin is uh, trying to strike a deal which would be totally unprecedented for India. And that's for uh, joint operations of the military. So the Russian troops and uh, the Indian troops would uh, fight together. The Russian fighter jets and uh, the Indian fighter jets would uh, fight together. S same with the warships. And if uh, Putin can do that, wow that's going to blow the minds away in Washington, D.C. So the background for all of this and uh, the reason for all of this is that uh, the Indian elites have finally understood uh, the uh, rise of uh, the multipolar world and that uh, uh, the U.S. empire is not going to last that long. Uh, because if you... Uh, you know, read the articles in India over the last, you know, like uh, since uh, the COVID days, uh, there was this like uh, fantasy, you know, uh, they thought that all the manufacturing from China was going to come to India. Wow, you know, we're going to be like the next China. We're going to be the manufacturing superpower. Uh, that didn't happen. And then when uh, the Ukraine war started, a lot of the uh, think tanks in India said, oh, my God, uh, Russia is going to be isolated. Putin is not going to last too long. Uh, Russia has nothing to offer and so on. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the typical American talking points. But the uh, last two years have been a wake up call. So Russia is strong. China is strong. Uh, the uh, world hasn't uh, changed as the U.S. predicted. So basically, well, India is uh, going back to her, uh, the real love, you know, Russia, the uh, steady lover for the last uh, 75, 80 years. So that's the story. Yeah, that's remarkable. Um, and at the same time, we had Viktor Orban basically um, make an unprecedented trip, which no doubt took quite a bit of courage given um, the reaction that we've seen um, from his European partners in particular, as well as partners in, well, partners is a is a loose word, but um, the partners in Washington. Um, David, as I said, you're actually a stone's throw away from where Orban ended up meeting with Trump. But um, from your perspective, um, could you just fill in the picture, I guess, in terms of um, what Orban's been doing and why that matters in this week of... Um, of, of really, in many ways, um, uh, it, it's a transformative week. Well, basically, for uh, uh, the Prime Minister Viktor Orban's trip to uh, Moscow and to Beijing, uh, it says a lot about his concerns about what lies ahead for Europe, because NATO is going to be pushing one way or another. As a matter of fact, there is now a conversation. I had a chance to talk to some of my contacts in Europe, that there's a conversation right now in Brussels within the EU Council as to sort of removing the presidency of uh, uh, Hungary, because Hungary is taking the presidency for, for the next six months of the European Union, which is will be a violation of the law, basically, and the so-called the democratic norm. How can you remove someone because he or she is doing the right thing? And what Orban uh, sort of embarked on was courageous, taking a stand and preventing Europe from another disaster war. This is exactly why the European Union did like it. And it's not about the European Union, it's what Washington dictates to Europe, because we here in the United States, our foreign policy has always been 
heavy on a rhetoric, but it is empty on substance. I mean, we didn't have a foreign policy strategy for the last 30 or 40 years. And now things come into the open, if I may use the term here, especially with NATO <laughs> declaration during their final communique. As far as, for example, I'll give you just a quick example here. And I know some of my uh, panelists here uh, mentioned this earlier, the opening of the office in Amman, in Jordan. So why the heck is NATO going to open an office in Amman? Because the concern now that Middle Eastern countries, the like of Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, or have pivoted east and the pivoted east because of economic incentives economic prosperity that is the reason why nato wanted to sink its claws inside jordan to protect of course the monarchy uh, from falling because jordanians are finding it very very concerning that there are american troops on their soil without their knowledge as it was uh, in the tanaf base which is on the border between uh, uh, jordan and syria that's where it was now, the idea of why uh, uh, there is this pushback against Mr. Orban uh, uh, initiative, it's because the West, the collective West, does not want a peace. They want to maintain, especially NATO wants to maintain the narrative that there is always an enemy by personifying now North Koreans and the Chinese as the main enemy in Asia. Why? Because they wanted to take, and this is nothing new now, uh, I was aware of the conversation even back in my days in Washington, D.C. The whole conversation about pivoting towards China started in 2004. And we were like, OK, why? Why do we need to pivot over to uh, Asia 4? Why are you targeting China? Why is this? Why is that? The whole objective of it was at that time still, and it will be, to prevent any economic progression for the whole Asia. That is what's at the heart of it. Uh, uh, Mr. Orban's initiative is not sort of, uh, it's, it's reflecting very uh, good on his part, but it is not boding well for the European and the American uh, sort of political elites. Yeah, a lot of things going on. I know you're in Beijing. Um, well, I'm guessing you're in Beijing. You could be anywhere, actually. But um, uh, I guess I really just wanted to round out the picture before diving a little bit more into thinking about the future. Um, Beijing was singled out in the NATO um, declaration as being a decisive um, uh, enabler, I think was the words, of, um, of Russia. Um, Beijing's obviously reacted to that, but I'm interested in not only your take on Beijing's reaction to that very specific allegation, but also how how you're sensing the sort of overarching big picture looks like from um, from that part of the world as far as this these transformations are taking place. Well, I mean, there's there's always plenty of divisions within uh, the Chinese government in terms of what they uh, direction. Uh, there's always the the side that says we need to do tit for tat. We need to show them we're serious. Uh, then you have others who say, well, you know, uh, when you see a man running towards a cliff. You don't have to push them over. Uh, right now, the U.S. has tactics. They have strategies. At most, it takes you out two years, but there, there's no end game. Um, that has been very apparent. Uh, I, I, I wish people understood, and uh, <laughs> I think some of you do who've been in Washington, how little regard Americans have for Europe and the rest of the world. Part of it's racial. Um, uh, with Europe, it goes back to World War II. Uh, in World War One, you know, you know, these people are unreliable. We have to take them in hand. Blah blah blah. Uh, right now, we simply are trying to shift uh, the cost of policing the world without giving up the baton, uh, and that's uh, basically all of this stuff with NATO is about. Um, what's interesting is, as the panel pointed out, you have groups that are acquiescing. Uh, you know. Um, in terms of the Philippines, uh, Marcos, and then you have uh, others who are not. Uh, obviously, uh, India is playing a game. Uh, coincident, uh, I mean, I would just want to add my take on the Indian situation. Modi blames the U.S. Uh, for interfering in the election. He believes they played a part in his um, you know, ignominious win. He wanted to win big and he didn't uh, get it. 
Uh, so there is some uh, concern on his part that the U.S. thinks that they own him and he wants to show that uh, he's his own man. He's also looking for some sort of political win. It's uh, no secret that he would like to have India on the Security Council. Uh, that would take uh, the uh, cooperation of China, obviously. Uh, Russia it probably could go along with it. The U.S. Uh, have said that they would. Uh, that leaves Britain and, and the rest. Um, and it, there's some sense that the reason that Jay Shankar has now mentioned three times that he wants to deal with the border dispute is that perhaps that would be the quid pro quo for allowing India on the Security Council. I just don't think it, it will work. Uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, you also have Russia uh, in America. We're the victim of our own predictions. Uh, we said Russia, as pointed out by the panelists, uh, would fail, uh, they'd lose the war, and their economy would go gone, and Putin would be on the street, or if not hanging from a lamppost. That didn't happen, and that's obviously emboldened the world. Um, right now, I'm, I'm very much in the camp uh, that says if you see somebody running towards a cliff who's you know not your friend, you, you don't need to stop them, and you certainly don't need to try to help them over. Uh, the U.S. has no endgame. Uh, getting these countries that are in dire economic stress to put 2% of their <clears throat> budgets into the military uh, is not going to work out with the voters long term. Uh, they're concerned about domestic issues. You've seen this through countless surveys. Uh, this is what they want, and they're not getting it from their elites. And so at some point, the, you know, the, uh, the runway uh, ends. And uh, there's no lift off, and they will be ignominiously uh, shuffled off, and some, somebody else. I'm not saying they'll be better. I'm just saying that some populists, as you have with the um, uh, the right, uh, will come in and say that you know we can help you just get rid of the foreigners and things. So it's not a, a good uh, projection uh, into the future, but you certainly can see all these uh, different currents playing out. Mm -hmm.